we're back, and I'd like to introduce our next guest, who is a, a personal friend of mine. Uh, Werner is the founder of a thing called EST, which is Earhart Seminar Training. And it's an organization that began about two years ago in San Francisco and has taught about, or trained, I should say, about 600 people a month uh, in five cities around the country. They have about 12,000 graduates, and I should mention that I'm a graduate of EST myself. And I found the time that I spent in this training seminar one of the most exciting and interesting experiences of my life. And I'm very excited to be able to have him here on the show, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you a very good friend of mine, Mr. Werner Earhart. Werner, where do you see, or where do you, from your experience, see that people are at today? John, for the most part, I think it's uh, about that extra eighth of an inch. You know, uh, the people that we've trained are, for the most part, getting the things they want out of life. They, they've gotten all the things, they've gotten the positions, their income is the kind of income they want, and yet they seem to go for the rest of it, that something that goes beyond the symbol to the experience of it, the meaning of it rather than just the business of it. I think a good example of it is that most people, they go out to buy a new car and they expect to have a good, a good experience. You know, a new car is a great experience. And uh, they expect that when they have a new car, it's going to make them happy. And it does for about three days, and then the payments go on for a couple of years after that. And I think that what people are looking for now is the rest of it. You know, what goes on beyond the symbols. Because we don't seem to be able to get enough symbols quite. I understand. Uh, uh, symbols, it seemed to me like things were going very well for me in my life, and yet there still were some things that I was looking for. Life wasn't complete, perhaps it still isn't, but uh, since my participation experience with the training, there's a whole lot more to life to me. And uh, there's a, a word that you use a great deal in the training that is aliveness. And I'd like you to tell people what aliveness is to you. Well, essentially, it's that sense that all of us have that thing that keeps us moving anyhow, the notion that there's something there beyond the business of it all, and we've broken it down to four words, or really four experiences. The first one is happiness, and it's not the thing that happens when you get a new car. It's, I guess, best epitomized by a guy walking down the street smiling about nothing. And uh, as far as love is concerned, it's not that, you know, Plato called that a grave mental disease. And uh, for the most part, if you listen to a lot of songs, it sounds like it may be a grave mental disease. And what we're talking about with love is that thing that allows you to be in touch with what's happening right now. So you, you're just experiencing what's going on right now, and it's all right just the way it is. It doesn't have to be any different right now. Uh -huh. And yet you're open for it to change. And then as far as health is concerned, it's not so much passing the yearly physical. It's uh, a body that gets up at the same time you do instead of five hours later. Someone mentioned the George, body. yes, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, there I am. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate... I'm watching over here on the tube. Great. <laughs> at any rate, this uh, health that we're talking about is a body that gets up when you do that doesn't need five cups of coffee or doesn't need three martinis to come down at the end of the day or doesn't need a joint to be high a body that can experience all of those things when that's what's happening at the moment. And self-expression, that's the toughest one of all to describe, John. It's that thing that you, that lets you know that you've, that people have experienced you. It's not so much I did it my way. Uh -huh. It's that you've been experienced by other people. You've touched them and they've touched you. And that's how we break aliveness down. I see. Uh, in speaking of aliveness and being in touch with yourself, uh, how does that differ from what a lot of people uh, think of as, uh, as positive thinking and saying, okay, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to feel good, whatever? Yeah, the kind of thinking that uh, we train people for is not positive thinking, but honest thinking. Mm -hmm. It's our notion that if you've got some negative thoughts and you, and you butter them over with positive thoughts, then the negative thoughts express themselves unconsciously. Mm -hmm. And you find yourself so that, yeah, you've got the things you've, you've been striving for in life, but the joy doesn't go with them. Mm -hmm. 
And so what we do in the training is to give people the opportunity to get in touch with the person that they're afraid they are so that they can actually experience the person that they're afraid they are. And it's an amazing thing. When you experience the person you're afraid you are, you suddenly get beyond that to experience the person you really are. I see. Uh, we'll return with our guests shortly right after we pause for this commercial message. Thank you. a short time left, Werner, and is there anything that we could do here so that people listening, uh, watching, or people here in the audience could get a sense of, of what you're trying to say, something that they could try themselves, that they could do themselves to find out for themselves and experience for themselves the things you're talking about, of being in touch with yourself? And yes, John, as you know, we talk in the training about uh, creating space for the things in your life that are kind of fitting on you and things that you'd like to resist, and uh, you'd to demonstrate Yes, yeah, so what do you mean by creating space? Can you explain that? Yeah, I can. I think, best, I think the thing we can do best to uh, give the viewers a sense of what I mean by that is to do a demonstration. And if you'll assist me, we can walk out here and do that. Great. Right here, is this all right? Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm going to ask John to be the thing in life that would be hitting on me. And uh, we'll just ask you to hit on me. All right, great. So, yeah, and do it. Okay. Yeah. So that would be the thing that would be hitting on me, and, and there are a couple of responses. One of the responses is to avoid what's hitting on you. Another response is to get hit on and play the victim. And then you have another response, and John, I'd like you to really do it this time. And that is to create the space for it. Now, essentially, it looks like I'm walking away or moving away. Maybe we could do that on this side. They can see better over here. Okay, no, great. That you're right. here. And essentially, is all I'm doing is saying, okay, there's that thing there, and I'm going to make space for it. I'm going to accept that it's there. It's like the traffic jam tomorrow morning. Yes. If I can say, okay, there's a traffic jam there, and I'm going to let it be there, instead of standing there resisting it, or instead of being the victim of it, or if I can say, well, yeah, the boss is going to be that way tomorrow, yeah. or the people I work with are going to be that way tomorrow, and if I can just let them be that way, oftentimes the things that I felt like I had to resist kind of disappear. Yeah. And then you can even go a step further. If you do that in a great big motion and move in close to what it is that you are resisting, or as a matter of fact, do one more time, if you just come and become the source of it, in other words, take full responsibility, it disappears altogether. And you notice there's no me over there anymore to get hit on. And it really works if you can just kind of take responsibility for what it is that you've been avoiding. I, I, can, I can verify that. I, uh, I wrote a song about it, as a matter of fact, and what Werner's talking about is taking responsibility for your life and uh, to take responsibility for these things that hit on you. And uh, it's amazing. Oh, it's amazing how it works. And it's, it's just an exciting thing to me. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. A few minutes right after this station break. Thank you. It is amazing to me how fast the time spent here doing this show goes. Uh, it's such a pleasure being here, and I'd like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank our guests, George Maharis and Bill and Taffy Danoff, Bill Dana, Sherry Lewis, and Warner. I thank you very much for being here. And you folks have been just a wonderful audience, very supportive, and I appreciate that. I'd like to acknowledge you for that. I would like to invite you to watch uh, this coming Wednesday night, the Bob Hope Show, which I am a guest on, and I'm excited about that. Also, tomorrow night, Johnny will be back, and his guests will be Bob Hope, Diana Rigg, Roy Clark, and from the world champion Miami Dolphins, Larry Kasaka, and Jim Kick. It's been a great, great pleasure for me to be here. I thank you, Fred Cordova, and all the people on tonight's show. Program was pre recorded. High on the bestseller charts called The Dragons of Eden. Speculations on the evolution of human intelligence. Far out. Please welcome Dr. Carl Sagan.
may I call you Carl sure, as opposed to doctor or anything like that? I admire you more than I can say, and, and I've, I've read some of your books, not all of them. I'm about half through this one, and uh, we're interested in, in very many things, and I know that both of us have, have tried to, to put this opportunity together of sitting and talking for a while, and I just would like to know one thing. You, you recently sent a, a record out into space and did not include any of my songs on it. <laughs> I'm a little ticked. Wow. <laughs> What can I and I'm only John? kidding. I, we, you know, we, we intended to send only the best, uh, so... Oh, no, now, that's... <laughs> one for you. No, it, it was, uh, it was mainly Eastern and Western classical music and, uh, and a lot of, uh, and beautiful ethnic music and from, uh, And other earth sounds, I understand. Lots of, lots of earth sounds, including, uh, sound, not just sounds of human voices, but uh, sounds of whales, the other sort of intelligent species on the, on the planet. And uh, as far as um, American music, we, we just sent, uh, let's see, we sent Johnny B. Good with By Chuck uh, Berry. Chuck Berry, okay. we sent uh, a, That's okay. Louis, a Louis Armstrong, and we sent a, uh, a piece by a marvelous uh, blind blues singer uh, called Blind Willie Johnson. Mm -hmm. now, now, this is on the Viking spacecraft? No, this is Voyager, which Voyager, will, in which fact, is... leave the solar system eventually. This is not what Voyager is about. This uh -huh. thing tacked on Voyager is, is about a remarkable study of Jupiter and Saturn and their 20-some-odd moons and maybe Uranus. Uh, get 50,000 photographs of yeah. the outer solar system. It's going to be a marvelous set of things in 1979, 1981. But then it leaves, and if anybody picks it up at some later time, they'll know something about us. Uh, something about us. And most, mostly you think that we'll pick it up sometime in the future. Well, it's going to be an awful long time uh, at the before. slow rate that we're able to send okay. spacecraft before anybody else, before it reaches a place where anybody else might be, I guess. One of the things that I love that is so well communicated in your books is, as a scientist, which most of the scientists I know are, are kind of stiff and they talk very closed, it seems to me, but you really communicate your enthusiasm about no enthusiasm about about knowing about these things out here. You talk about the moons of Jupiter and that there's a moon out there that is that is uh, an an orange. Yep. Has an orange atmosphere or, or leaves a well, donut. It's it's Io, yeah, which is a big moon of Jupiter and it's orange. And why? And why, why is, is it that? orange? You know, what's it made of? And what are we going to find out about that? What do you think we'll find? Well, some people think that Io is a place which used to have a big ocean which all trickled away into space, uh -huh. and all that's left on the surface is the salts of that ocean that are being fried because Jupiter is sitting in this enormous radiation belt. Yeah. Uh, and Io is plowing through that radiation belt. All these charged particles are striking the surface, splaying the salts off into yeah. space. Maybe that's wrong. It's a popular idea in some circles these days. But the thing is, we'll be able to find out. That's a very different place than here, yeah. the moon. <laughs> Our solar system is really interesting. Oh, man, I think so, too. I'm an amateur astronomer, you see, and every once in a while up in my house, I have people come up and I show them the stars, and I'll start with a planet, the moon, and then a planet, then a star, then a double star, then a nebula, perhaps, and a, a globular cluster like M13, and then a, a galaxy, and it blows them away. You ought to, to keep pushing this astronomy stuff. Oh, I, really, stuff. I like it a lot. <laughs> I want to go into space. You know, I was very excited. W were you at the uh, launching of the Enterprise, the first flight? Uh, I was there. At yeah, the first I was. Flight. I was there too. That was boy. That was exciting. I want to go up on that. Well, you know that uh, yeah. passengers are permitted after a while. Maybe one of these days. <laughs> have, have we found things on? Have you been disappointed in our findings on Mars, or or is it mostly reflecting your comment that we went to a couple of the most boring places we could think of to visit there, and and have we learned much? Or? Oh. Um, the, the results from Mars on Viking have just been spectacular. It's revolutionized our knowledge about the weather, the chemistry of the surface, the geology, the interior, the past climate, which turns out to be much more Earth-like than present Mars, and some fabulously enigmatic, unsolved results uh, about biology or something that looks a little bit like it. The, yeah, right there is. You some have some new very pictures. Recent findings, um, like released today. And uh, this is a kind of picture if I can from. I it over yeah. here. Okay. Oops, excuse me, Mike. This, this is a picture from some months ago, and taking in a place called Utopia um, on Mars in the north. And if you look right here, this is a kind of rock with some holes in it. And the only thing to notice is that there isn't uh, anything like frost around it. Well, here's the picture taken just a little while ago, and. Released today. This is that same rock 
and you can see all this white stuff all around it. It has snowed, but it's not, some people think, it is not ordinary snow, but dry ice. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has frozen out, some people think, because of the remarkably low temperatures. It's in the middle of the Martian winter. And has it, has it fallen in snow, or is that frost? There's a debate. Most people think it's frost. And here is a color picture of that same rock. You can see a lot of Viking spacecraft in the front. Here's the rock over here, and you can see the, the frost near it. And that's just one small example of a way in which a, another planet is like the Earth in some ways, different from the Earth in other ways, and the comparison of what happens on another planet and the Earth helps to illuminate both planets. We learn about the Earth by looking at other planets. There are examples of different ways that planets can evolve. I was interested in, in your uh, feelings about the sun getting hotter and that someday Mars will probably have a climate like unto that of the Earth and the Earth will be more like Venus as opposed to our solar system falling back into the sun that it's the sun that's expanding and growing. Well, the sun is getting hotter. There's a little, little doubt about that. Yeah. And what you just said is something I have said. Yeah. I'm glad to agree with you. Uh, but the time scale... <laughs> but the time scale is like five billion years that all is going to happen. So it's not like our most pressing problem. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have to worry about well, we, that. We've got other things uh, that are sort of more, yeah. more important and pressing, not just about, about human beings, but about the other, the other animals on our planet as well. I'm very interested in, in your new book from the point of view of having looked so much out there and having so many aspirations or, or dreams about what's going on out there that now looking right here on our own home planet, you've, you've I, I hesitate to say you've discovered some brand new things about the planet, but uh, in, in looking at the life that we have here, there is almost extraterrestrial life here, a life that we don't understand or know, which is the whales and the dolphins. Well, there's, there's no question that uh, those are extremely interesting animals. They're sort of cousins of ours. The last common ancestor between us and them was maybe 50, 40 million years ago. There's no question that they're very smart. And uh, the big catastrophe is that we're hunting and killing the dolphins and the whales before we've even had a chance to find out about them, to say nothing of the ethical question of is it right to kill another very intelligent organism. So to give an example of one one serious problem <coughs> there's a kind of whale called the bowhead yes it's i'm familiar with that 60 feet long yes, you i've seen a bowhead whale have you yeah there's only a thousand of them left in the world on the planet as on far the as planet we know, yeah. as far as we know and what's more that's too little if the present hunting rate is continued for them to grow yeah. there's a certain population density and below that they're just gone well u.s government has uh, not prevented, not abided by an agreement by the International Whaling Commission okay. to prevent the hunting of the... We'll do whale. something about that. I guess we have to break. Station break. I'm sorry. TV Wonder says we've got so far to come to get there. Tomorrow night, Johnny will be back, and uh, they celebrate the 15th anniversary of The Tonight Show. <laughs> and uh, it'll be a special two-hour show with uh, some memorable moments, I would imagine. Probably a few surprises, people stopping by. I hope you'll watch. I'll be watching. I'll be back on Monday night. I look forward to that. I thank all of you for being with me. It's a joy to be with you and to share this evening with you folks. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Wait, Ed. Oh, always. Constantly. You look fantastic. Thank you. And you know, all these old dudes are really getting it together. Now, I I don't mean to be impolite, but, but Ed is looking great. My manager, Jerry Weintraub, is slimming right up. Le yesterday, I was with Frank Sinatra in Las Vegas, rehearsing for a thing we're doing Saturday night, and he looks like a million, several million dollars. <laughs> but he looks, he looks like that guy that uh, I've seen pictures of in newsreels walking out on the uh, Paramount Theater stage there in New York. Fantastic sang last night. It was a great show. It's going to be a great show tonight. I'm happy to be here, folks. We have uh, Carl Reiner, who directed me in my first film. The kid is going to be a movie star. Well, now. That may be premature. I appreciate your enthusiasm, but we'll have to wait and see. Anyway, Carl Reiner and uh, Valerie Harper. And uh, <laughs> Helen Schneider, who is a young lady who sings... Well, you'll hear in a while, you can decide for yourselves, and Dr. Carl Sagan. And I would like to sing a couple of songs for you. I've, I've been away from this for a while, and uh, 
uh, am looking forward to going back to work. We're going in the studio this month to record a new album, then I've got a tour of Australia. But I've been singing in situations that, where there were not really audiences, but friends sitting around a fire in the woods or around a living room, just the guitar and myself. And that's kind of the way it started for me, so I'd like to do it that way tonight. Now, I'll go sit down if I may. This is one of my, simply one of my favorite songs. This is Annie's song. You fill up my senses like a night in a forest, like the mountains in springtime, like a walk in the rain, like a storm in the desert, like a sleepy blue ocean. Once in a while you sing a song and all of a sudden it's totally new again. What a thrilling thing that is. This is a song that uh, is also one of my favorites, written for Captain Jacques Cousteau and all who serve him on the good ship Calypso.
street.